Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. <laughs> um, I'm Shahid Avari, I'm one of the fellows of the Forum and I'm chairing this event. Um, so this event is on biography. Uh, when the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau set out to write his Confessions in 1782, he proposed to set before my fellow mortals a man in all the truth of nature. This man shall be myself. So philosophers have long engaged with the confessional form, uh, from Plato and Augustine to Derrida and Sixu. So is biography an inherently philosophical medium? And how does the life impact the philosophy of any given thinker? Should we make a distinction between the facts of a real life and philosophical thought? And what is the relationship between the truths of philosophy and the art of biography? So I should let you know we have three wonderful thinkers today. Uh, one of the originally advertised thinkers, Rachel Holmes, the, uh, the, the writer of the really brilliant uh, biography of Eleanor Marx, hasn't been able to make it today. She's had a, a personal issue, and she sends her sincere apologies. Um, uh, but we've had a brilliant last-minute substitution, um, and I don't think you'll notice at all. Um, but let me start with our guests. So Hannah Dawson is a lecturer in the History of Political Thought at King's College London down the road. She's working on, or she has worked on early modern theories of language, their relationship to natural, moral and political philosophy, with a focus on Locke um, and a book on Hobbes, Life Lessons from Hobbes, uh, and more recently interests in feminism and political thought. Helen Tyson is a lecturer in 20th and 21st century British literature in the Department of English at the University of Sussex. Her interests lie between psychoanalysis and modernist literature, and her first book is coming, she says, um, and it's called Reading Modernism's Readers. Uh, I think you'll be, exp be able to explain why when we start talking. Um, and she's edited a collection called Wilding Analysis, Psychoanalysis Beyond the Couch, which I'm in, so it's really good, <laughs> so good. <laughs> and Robert Roland Smith, he's a writer and philosopher. He's written a popular, he's written lots of popular philosophy stuff. Um, well, Breakfast popular. with... <laughs> popular amongst us, Breakfast with Socrates, The Philosophy of Everyday Life, and most recently, and I think we'll talk about this perhaps, Autobiophilosophy, an intimate story of what it means to be human, which is a philosophical biography, basically. I wonder why we invited you, Robert. Um, maybe we can start with you, Robert. Um, can you set up the place of autobiography in the philosophical tradition? Who are we talking about here? Who are the key writers and thinkers? And what are they attempting to accomplish by writing biographically? Okay, thanks, Shaila. Well, I suppose it's probably worth just getting clear on whether we're talking about biography or autobiography and just sort of setting out some, some little markers there. And I think, uh, although there have been some very notable biographies of philosophers, uh, Ray Monks Wittgenstein, for example, comes to mind, um, and certain others, I think we're really talking about philosophers as autobiographers um, or as potentially biographers of other people, but from a philosophical perspective. And I know there are some overlaps between those different categories, but I, think, I don't think we're mainly talking about biographies, or at least I'm not talking about yeah. mainly about biographies of philosophers, but the role of biography as a philosophical enterprise and autobiography as a philosophical enterprise. So that's, that's at least where I'm coming at this, but we can, we can complicate that if we want to. Um, I guess the second thing... Uh, to go to is whether there is a general compatibility or incompatibility between philosophy and autobiography. Because um, you could argue that both ways, I think. Uh, and if you think of the, in a sense, the, the kind of the, the most uh, philosophically important person in the Western tradition, along with Aristotle, and you think of Socrates, one of the things Socrates is known for, among other things, is the life he lived and the life that he lived philosophically. So, you know, we have a kind of coming together of those two things. And kind of philosophy is a living autobiography in the case of Socrates. And then if we take that forward to other kind of famous uh, writer, philosophical writers of autobiography that you've uh, already referenced, you know, particularly Rousse in particular Rousseau and Augustine, but also Nietzsche and Derrida, we also have there, you know, very intimate sense in which philosophy and autobiography are 
are combined. So on the one hand, it would seem from that tradition, Socrates, Augustine, Rousseau, uh, uh, Nietzsche, Derrida, it would seem that there is a natural affinity or at least not a problem with combining philosophy and autobiography in some way. But at the same time, on the other hand, we can say actually there's a deep contradiction between the two uh, endeavors. And in fact, it's something that particularly Nietzsche and particularly Derrida worry at because there is a claim, depending on your uh, philosophical preferences, that philosophy should be anything but autobiographical, that philosophy should be an objective, not a subjective discipline, and that once you start to include um, contingent facts about the life of the philosopher, you're corrupting what should be uh, a purely dispassionate, um, objective uh, uh, set of writings. And I suppose the most extreme version of that position is, is captured in Heidegger's lovely phrase. He says, uh, he was born, he thought, he died. <laughs> uh, and for Heidegger, that was pretty much all you ever needed to know about the, about the life of the philosopher in question. So from that perspective, philosophy and autobiography should be entirely decoupled from one another. And that's a you know, tradition that goes back, I mean, maybe Hannah will talk about this, certainly through you know, you know, rationalism, the attempt to make philosophy a science, and to yeah, precisely separate it out from any kind of infection from the, from the personal story. So I suppose that's how we sort of might begin to come at this in, in thinking that on the one hand they are you know, perfectly matched, philosophy and autobiography. On the other hand, that never the twain, that never the twain should meet. Uh, and perhaps we can talk about those, uh, those different aspects as we go through. What do you think? I mean, having written autobiography, yeah. should never the twain meet? Well, I mean, my personal prejudice on this is that philosophy can never be a purely scientific, objective discipline. It's always uh, situated historically. It's always situated contextually in some way. And although we can, uh, and particularly if you think of uh, kind of logical positivism, attempts in kind of hard-edged analytic philosophy to really produce, and certainly in kind of uh, philosophy of mathematics, that attempt to produce an entirely dehumanized philosophy, I think you can nevertheless always find ways in which that discourse leaks in some way. And given that it does leak, and given my prejudices are towards continental <laughs> philosophy, um, I think it's better to embrace that and find ways in which the two can actually be combined in interesting ways. And uh, I guess ultimately that comes down to, you know, what's the point of philosophy? And if part of the point of philosophy is to help us understand life, then I think writing about life is not a bad uh, resource to avail oneself of. Mm. And do you ever think not just about, I mean, I'm thinking here not just about your own writing, but about your reading of people like Rousseau and Derrida, of course, that do you ever think that that kind of confessional candor destabilizes ideas of truth that philosophy privileges? Yes, yeah, so we have two different kinds of truth there, don't we? Yeah. We have truth as, you know, my story, um, and then we have truth as, you know, the other, the, the far end, if you like, in kind of philosophy of maths or in mathematics, yeah. two plus two equals four, which would seem to be an eternal unassailable truth. Now, I think one of the important uh, shifts that happens with Augustine's Confessions is that he reclaims the notion of truth with a capital T mm -hmm. into the subjective. Mm. So it's possible to talk about personal story and make a claim for something transcendent at the same time. But I think that's largely because he's essentially writing about a relationship with God and using himself as a um, sub subject of God in the telling of his truth about uh, coming to faith. So he kind of squares the circle in a way, I suppose, yeah. between the two. Yeah, well, Augustine always, is always squaring circles. He is always squaring and, circles. Um, but yeah. is, is there a, a in, in, in those examples, Augustine, Rousseau, Derrida, is there is the line between literature and philosophy more blurred, obviously? Right, okay, so that's the other, you know, if yeah. we're going to triangulate it, we've got, an, we've got another one there, haven't we? We've got philosophy, we've got biography, and then we've got literature. And of course, once you uh, start writing an autobiography, it's very hard not to add narrative elements, and once you add narrative elements, you introduce metaphor, you add, introduce conceit, you introduce all of those things, which, again, from a very hard philosophical point of view ought to be excluded from the philosophical text. In theory, 
The philosophical text should be unadorned. It should be a kind of diaphanous representation of the truth with mm. language as a mere sort of uh, empty screen through which truths can pass. Yeah. Once you get into biography, in a sense, you're almost uh, instantly kind of get catapulted into the world of literature too, literature too yeah. which uh, yeah, could be seen to be some sort of contamination of it. Yeah, well, I'm pushing you a bit here because okay. I feel like you're being very... Um, we're, we're all very polite and okay. kind about this and we're happy about books that move between philosopher and literature. But even yeah. a book like yours, ah. where does it sit on a, in Waterstones? Is it in literature? Is it in philosophy? Is yeah, that's a, good, uh, that's a good question. It actually sits in uh, mem yeah, biography, memoir. Memoir. Um, and that's an interesting choice by Waterstones. And I found out recently, actually, that... It's not up to a publisher to define where a book will sit in the bookshop. I thought it was. You categorize it yeah. uh, at the point of the uh, kind of it being edited. It, it is actually up to Amazon or Waterstones to decide where it's going to fit. Yeah. You know, and that's down to all sorts of other choices. But yeah, I mean, personally, um, if you want me to kind of show my hand a bit more, I mean, I think it's critical for philosophers in the modern age to draw upon their personal experience and bring that to bear partly to make philosophy relevant to a wider public, but partly, partly because I think uh, there is richness in personal experience that can help to uh, sharpen our kind of philosophical understanding of otherwise abstract concepts. Yeah. So I, you know, obviously, I mean, Ringtones are like that. They're a form of personal experience intruding upon the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, the... Just on that, I mean, the point of writing that book, I was trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Yeah. You know, just a little side project. Yeah. <laughs> a and couple of weeks. I, did, I started out by thinking, well, okay, I'm going to write a book about Heidegger and Nietzsche and, and so on. And I thought, well, you know, what's the value in that? Yeah. I mean, first of all, it won't be as good as other experts on Heidegger and Nietzsche. But secondly, that, that question's going to have much more uh, texture to it if I take a greater risk, essentially, and introduce personal material. So I think that was the point about it, really. Yeah, yeah. I think we can push more about that distinction between literature and philosophy, because I think there are some philosophers for whom a certain body, perhaps of continental philosophy, is firmly in the literary territory, yeah. and for others, sure. where that, that, bl that blurred boundary is productive and kind yeah. and all of those things. And in fact, I'm hoping Helen might bring in some of the art of biography and the conceits yeah. and metaphors you were talking about. Actually, I wonder, Hannah and Helen, if you have anything to ask Robert yourselves. Um, well, I, um, so I love the way that you've introduced a relationship between autobiography and philosophy. Um, I suppose I, what I'm interested in is the relationship between a whole multitudinous lived life right. and then, as it were, the collapsing of that infinitely interpretable life into a writing about that life. I mean, by necessity, writing is going to collapse what might be you know, infinite into the finite, and whether you found that a struggle or a liberation, I mean, there's no tr one truth to one life, no, there is isn't. there? No, there isn't, and um, I think it's collapsed in a couple of ways. One is you're making an, a selection, it's highlights, or lowlights, <laughs> uh, you know, because, you know, you're not going to write about every minute that you're asleep in your life, okay? So yeah, it's collapsed in that way, but secondly, um, it's situated in time. So when you write about events from last mm. year, mm. they're going to be less processed than events mm. from 20 years ago. Mm. Mm. So there, there's a kind of double yeah. kind of collapsing that goes on. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think a thoroughly comprehensive review of one's life would take as long to write as it did to live it, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, and then there's all of that revision that goes on, and yeah. there's self-deception, there's hindsight, particularly if you're actually writing about other people, which, you know... Uh, Anybody who writes an autobiography will. You can't just write about yourself. There are a lot of ex-girlfriends in this book. There's ex-girlfriends in the book, and that <laughs> brings with it not just choices about what you write emotionally about yeah. people, but what you write legally about people. Yeah. And there was a long legal process I had to go through with that particular text. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a straightforward, uh, you know, endeavour yeah. at yeah. all. <laughs> no, okay, I'll come back to you in a minute about that. But I do you want to ask you about Orlando, because I know you're a Wolf Scholar. A uh, Virginia Woolf scholar, and the thing I remember about Orlando, I'm sure lots of people have read Orlando. It's the weirdest attempt at an autobiography, a fictional autobiography ever, isn't it? Biography, biography sorry, <laughs> uh, ever. It's it's very strange. Um, but the thing I remember about Orlando, other than all the time travelling, um, is that Woolf, of course, her father 
um, was the editor of the Dictionary of National Biography. And so there's some weird Oedipal stuff going on there, isn't there, in attempting to re rewrite the form of biography mm. itself. Mm. He was also, of course, a philosopher, which I hadn't really thought about <laughs> until you mentioned him just now. So, yeah, Wolfe's father, Sir Leslie Stephen, was incredibly famous for editing the Dictionary of National Biography, this lengthy, multi-volume tome of leather-bound lives of great men is the phrase that Wolfe uses to describe the Dictionary of National Biography. They're factual, short summaries of the lives of a series of predominantly Victorian white great men, Darwin et al, basically. And Wolfe spends a whole life kind of quarrelling with the, the kind of constraints of that form and thinking about how, how to write lives, how to write the lives of women into history. Wolfe's very concerned with um, the, the lives of the obscure is a phrase that she comes back to again and again, how to kind of write the um, unspoken voices of history into history. But Orlando is a very particular incarnation of Wolfe's fascination with, life, fascination with life writing. For those of you who don't know, I'm just going to give you a really brief summary. So Orlando, a biography, was first published 80 years ago in 1928. We recently held the Orlando birthday. Orlando begins the novel as a young English nobleman in the Elizabethan court. In the great frost of 1608, Orlando falls in love with a Russian princess called Sasha, who breaks his heart, following which he retreats into exile at his country home and writes reams and reams of terrible poetry. <laughs> Sometime later, Orlando travels to Constantinople, where he serves as the British ambassador, presides over a revolution, he marries a dancer called Rosina Pepita and then falls into a very long and very deep sleep. Orlando sleeps for about seven days. Um, nobody can wake him. And then eventually Orlando wakes up. Orlando wakes up as a woman who goes to live with a so-called gypsy tribe before returning as a woman to 18th century England. When she gets to England, she's confronted with a string of lawsuits. The chief charges against her werewolf rights, one, that she was dead, and therefore could not hold any property whatsoever. <laughs> Two, that she was a woman, which amounts to much the same thing. <laughs> Back in England, Orlando spends a great deal of time socialising with Addison, Pope and Swift in the coffee houses. She cross-dresses and spends time with prostitutes. But then a great cloud descends. It's the 19th century. The 19th century descends and... Orlando is battered down by the spirit of the age. She's compelled to wear crinolines. She has to find herself a husband. She has a baby. And then finally, Orlando emerges in the present day of the 1920s, where she drives a motor car and goes shopping in a department store on Oxford Street. So it's a very strange kind of biography. It's a kind of love letter. It's dedicated to Wolfe's lover, Vita Sackville West. Uh, it's described as, I think, the, the longest and most charming love letter in literature. Wolfe decided that she wanted to, or she wrote to Vita anyway, that she wanted to revolutionise biography in a night. It's an attempt to kind of break free of those Victorian constraints of the Dictionary of National Biography. It's an attempt to think... Uh, it's, it's a playful text. It's really... It's a great fun to read. It's a kind of romp through history. And Wolfe really writes about it in these terms as um, playful. She says... I found this quote from her... Uh, it's a letter to Vita. She says, Yesterday morning I was in despair... I couldn't screw a word from me, and at last dropped my head in my hands, dipped my pen in the ink, and wrote these words, as if automatically on a clean sheet. Orlando, a biography. No sooner had I done this than my body was flooded with rapture and my brain with ideas. I wrote rapidly till twelve. But listen, suppose Orlando turns out to be Vita, and it's all about you and the lusts of your flesh and the lure of your mind. Shall you mind? Say yes. Or no. So she's dealing with that question there of writing the, the, the relationships in her life into a kind of fictional biography. But she sees it as a kind of, as an escapade, a break away from the serious, poetical, high modernist works that she's been writing up to this point. But I think in the process, what starts out as a kind of a lark, a bit of fun, becomes really quite a serious mm. philosophical text. It's, it's a really powerful piece of writing about gender, about sexuality, about history, and by the end, we have this figure of Orlando juggling all the different selves that she's been within her mind, trying to kind of think how she can collect all the, all the past selves together into one Orlando in the present day.
So when she's in this department store in Oxford Street, she thinks she's seen Sasha, the Russian princess, from back in the Elizabethan age. And she sees that Sasha's growing fat. But then she kind of gets, it has this sort of experience of um, sort of temporal dislocation. And she has to call out to herself, Orlando, Orlando, and, and summon the present day self into being. Thank you. Doesn't that make you run, run off and read it again, if you haven't read it? And you can also watch um, Tilda Swinton, yeah. uh, uh, who was born to be Orlando. Mm. The thing I, I, I want to ask you about is that you've described Orlando, and I remember it as you described it, mm. as, a, as a playful, anarchic text. But it seems to me it's also an act of sabotage, isn't it? I mean, I mentioned the Oedipal thing, mm. but kicking back at your father's kind of very uh, regimented attempt to order public life by noting and listing and itemising all the people of merit mm. in, your, in your world. And it, it seems to me a critique and an attempt mm. to sabotage the very idea of biography because who get, the, there are questions that come with it, right? Who gets to be biographised? Mm. Who is a person to be remembered? Mm. Is that right? I think it is, although... I would say that Wolf spends a great deal of her life worrying about how to find a kind of a form of truth via fiction. So I think she feels that the great problem with the Victorian biography is that in the attempt to record every single material fact of an individual's life, it misses the mark. Uh, so it's not an utter dismissal of the form. Yeah. Uh, there's still a real attempt to distill an individual life into a text, yeah. despite the rejection of the, the 19th century form of life writing. And what about with your other hat on as someone who works in psychoanalysis? Mm. Do you read biography and autobiography with a sceptical, with a pair of Freudian glasses on? Do you read between the lines? Do you mistrust biography, or autobiography at least? Mm. Because we are, we, we lie to ourselves, we are, yeah. we are we're never true to ourselves mm. according to mm. psychoanalysis. Yeah. <laughs> the short answer, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that I think that Wolf is very interested in that kind of element of self-deception as well. So when she comes to write uh, about her own life, she's very alert to the ways in which we can try to deceive ourselves. We present certain images of ourselves to others. Uh, we we make ourselves up through stories, and that is how that's necessary for psychoanalysis as well. That we that we find stories to live by. But it's also necessary that we acknowledge that they are stories. Myths. Yes. Yeah. Does Freud write about biographical, um, the biographical tradition and acts of autobiography? Does he think about memoir, for instance? He's a great fan of Wolf's great friend Lytton Strachey, who's the really celebrated figure in the history of modernist life writing. Lytton Strachey publishes a book in 1918 called Eminent Victorians, mm. and it's a great uh, kind of mockery of the prurience and the bolderization of Victorian life writing. So he's, he kind of turns an irreverent eye to these figures, these eminent Victorian figures. And Freud loved Lytton Strachey's work yeah. and really um, celebrated it. But I think also Freud's writing, Freud's perhaps one of these philosophers who, who builds his philosophy, psychoanalysis, out of an act of, of life writing, out of an attempt to uh, write his own life to analyse his dreams. That's how psychoanalysis begins, yeah. really, is, is Freud in a process of self-analysis. Yeah, that's a remarkable thing to think, isn't it? That, that a whole intellectual tradition, however you feel mm. about it, might come about through an act of self-engagement and reflection yeah. with the facts of your own life. Mm. I think you can totally see that. I think about when he writes about Leonardo, or do, you mm. can think about any, any, but any artist that he writes about, that he reads the art through the life, of course, that's Psychoanalysis yeah. 101, isn't yeah. it? So he ha obviously has a very complex relationship to biography. I wonder, Robert and Hannah, if you had questions for Helen, our Wolf and Freud expert, it turns <laughs> out today. Well, I mean, I have the same question in a way that I put to, to Robert, which is about the kind of multiplicity of selfhood. Because in a way, I wasn't asking about sort of what you have for breakfast and then what happens in the next moment. I'm asking mm. precisely about the multiple truths mm -hmm. that exist in oneself, the multiple selves that we are, and that there's a sort of the, there's a kind of issue with 
the notion of biography and autobiography insofar as it threatens to collapse. But I suppose, of course, what's interesting about thinking about it in relation to Orlando and Wolfe and gender is that there's a way in which the very multiplicity of the self of Orlando is a, um, is a comment on the constraints on female selfhood that Wolfe is kind of engaging with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really the question that Wolf, I think, is constantly trying to uh, deal with herself and trying to think about how you put that multiplicity into a literary form without mm. it just being boring. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, the many multiple versions of myself probably aren't that interesting to other people. So I think what she does is she tries to find a literary form that will uh, pay tribute to yourself. <laughs> to that. <laughs> Hannah's the most interesting person in the world. I heard this <laughs> page open where Wolf, she's, she's, been, she's in the department store and she's having this moment that I was describing of kind of temporal dislocation. She thinks she's just seen her, her long lost love from 1608 in a department store in 1928. <laughs> and so she's, she's having a little struggle kind of making herself present. Mm -hmm. And Wolf describes here the... Um, what she says, she says it's, it cannot be denied that the most successful practitioners of the art of life, often an unknown people by the way, somehow contrive to synchronize the 60 or 70 different times which beat simultaneously in every normal human system, yeah. so that when 11 strikes, all the rest chime in unison, and the present is neither a violent disruption mm. nor completely forgotten in the past. So it's the attempt to find a sentence that will describe that feeling of, of multiple times within one body. That's great. Do you, when you ask that question, do you mean, when you talk about our multiple selves, do you mean Hannah the mother, Hannah the academic, Hannah the, or Hannah the grumpy person in the morning, Hannah the cheerful after two glasses of wine, Hannah, I'm just making that up. Furious so, right? after two glasses of wine. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean yeah. by the multiple selves? Yeah, well I mean both those sort of obvious roles that one might play, which are perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, classically harder to negotiate in a woman's life yeah. insofar as we're torn between them. Um, but I do also mean, you know, the life in dreams, the life in emotion, the way in which one moment I can feel like I'm only rage, <laughs> and yeah. the other moment I can feel like I'm only love. I mean, you know, how, how to reconcile those, those mm. kind of, the, the, you know, the way in which my whole self is suffused with something that's opposite to something the next moment. Mm. I think that's something about the consistency of a the inconsistency of our experience mm. and the kind of false consistency of our sentences and our grammar and the ways that we, we position ourselves. And I think that perhaps that comes back to the art of yeah. biography rather than the truths of philosophy, although that is in itself a truth, it seems to me. Robert, I wondered if you had a psychoanalytical yeah. Wolfian question. Yeah, well, my, yeah, my mind's fizzing now. <laughs> and um, actually, just on what Hannah said, I found that so interesting because it's not just the sort of various roles, as you say, in these different selves that we are, but also I think you can, you know, at a certain point in your life, say when you're 18, you th you're convinced mm. you are X, mm. but actually when you get to 53, you realise you actually, you were Y, but you were convinced yeah. that you were X at the time. Mm. You know, and that's very interesting, you know, that actually mm. our self-perception changes over time as well. Yeah. Um, but actually it was, um, I was thinking about Freud and, you know, in, in his writings in the 30s in particular, he talks a lot about the virtues of self-analysis and there's, he starts to, you know, encourage people to do that. So uh, I guess what's interesting about self-analysis is that you really are combining philosophy with autobiography because Freud is giving you the tools to say, you know, here are concepts like projection, denial, repression, and you can begin to tell your story in those terms. And of course... We have those tools implicitly, whether you use psychoanalytic ones yeah. or, or others, but they'll be so embedded in us, we don't even know we're, we're using them. Um, I was talking to uh, so a, a friend of mine, Andrew Scott, and his co-author, Linda Grattan, have written this quite successful book called The Hundred Year Life, mm. which talks about longevity and so on. And he was pointing out at this event last week, the Longevity Forum, that it's actually a very modern thing to even know your age. Mm. Right, it only really started. I can't remember exactly when it started, but yeah. it's like a 19th century thing when and versus a Western it, tradition mm. and a Western yeah. thing. Mm. But actually, you know, when I started mm. writing that book, when any of us begins to think about who we were, the chances are we will date it in some yeah. way or think what age we were. It's so hardwired into us, we don't even mm. sort of reflect on it, and already we're off on a certain tack with that, you know, which is a sort of somewhat bureaucratic tack, actually, or whatever. Anyway. Yeah. So, uh, so there's that. Then the other thing I was thinking about was Freud, you know, Freud worked in his house. He had his patients come in. He had Anna in there. 
he had the grandkids. When he writes about beyond the pleasure principle, he's writing about Ernst. Mm. You know, it's all completely intermingled. And the, the, you know, psychoanalysis is a discourse of the house. Yeah. You know, mm. in so many ways. You know, literally, there's a couch, in yeah. it, and that's where it takes place. Yeah. yeah. Except that men obviously inhabit their houses often differently to women. Yeah, sure, I mean, sure. that men are able to carve out a kind of a study and a domestic... Yeah. Sp um, I mean, uh, exactly a kind of insulated space within the house in a way that women, c um, you know, classically yeah. can't. And so I think that there is, it's very gendered the extent to which you want to collapse um, the household into psychoanalysis. I mean, I wish I could. Actually, <laughs> yeah. for Freud, for Freud, it wasn't like that. People would come in and out. There's a myth that there was a kind of secure frame. That came yeah. actually much later, the idea that there is this mm -hmm. bounded space. Yeah. But anyway. There's a lovely story about, um, I think, Elizabeth Anscombe um, dealing with Wittgenstein's papers in her house in Cambridge and the house being a complete mm. state and the, the papers being all over her living room floor mm. and people coming in and right. just that, that strange... Mm. Th I think the, spaces, the space in which work mm. happens is such an interesting... Thing to think about I me mean, for another forum event <laughs> but Hannah let me turn to you um, because I want to ask you as someone who has been working in uh, a more analytical version of philosophy um, although profoundly sympathetic it seems to me to lots of other forms of philosophy um, to what extent should we think about philosophical ideas through the lens of a philosopher's life at all I mean is it right to do so Right, so, so this question is about, Ooh. oh my god, <laughs> this question, and my notes, um, in answer to the question. Because, uh, yeah, the question comes because, yeah. because of your lock book, in a way, yeah. Life Lessons from Lock, yeah. There's another one, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so the like question... Life Lessons from Hobbes. <laughs> Life Lessons from Hobbes, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is about the relationship between um, ideas the ideas of a philosopher and the life out of which um, those ideas come. Um, and the question of whether we can and whether we should separate the ideas from a life. And actually, until relatively recently in the tradition of philosophy, ideas were radically separated from a life. That's to say, it used to be thought that what philosophers did was engage in big, perennial questions. Um, that, as it were, different philosophers through time answered. So if we think about Plato, you know, often invoked as the kind of father of, um, of Western philosophy, he asked questions such as, what is justice? Uh, what is freedom? Does virtue make you happy? How ought the state to be organized? Who ought to rule? And the thought was that philosophers through time, as it were, um, floated above history and above their lives and answered these questions. So Plato said kings should rule and Rousseau said the people should rule. And then there was this move in the history of philosophy which um, insisted on the importance of understanding ideas as coming from history and coming, the, the ideas don't exist in a kind of floating ether. They only exist insofar as they're articulated by particular people at particular times in particular places. And so, for example, the reason that Plato thought that kings had to rule and that democracy was appalling was because he lived in Athens in a form of direct democracy, which, according to him, killed his great love and mentor, Socrates. Um, Hobbes wrote the Leviathan, this extraordinary kind of terrifying book to many people, um, that, which said that the state had to be this kind of all-powerful monster, because Hobbes had lived through the English Civil War, and he saw the peculiar horror of what happens to a country when there is no government. And so he thought that what the state had therefore to do was to be this terrifying thing that would force people to behave. Locke who came a little bit after Hobbes, didn't have in the forefront of his experience the terror of civil war. Rather, he had the problem of an overbearing, tyrannical king. So his theory was about the importance of kings being an accountable, governments being accountable, and the right that the people ought to have to revolution. So, so, there's, so there's the move to want to situate ideas in the context uh, in which they are written. But what you might notice about uh, all the thinkers that I've thus far mentioned is that they're all men, um, <laughs> and that they're all pr privileged uh, white men. 
And I think that um, the relationship between ideas and a life, or ideas and context, is figured differently depending on whether you're a woman or a man. Um, I think that if you're a man, if you're a male writer, male thinker, you are allowed, you are permitted by the reader to, as it were, transcend the particularity of your life and be thought of as being able to write from a kind of objective, universal viewpoint. So even the men that I've discussed, and I've contextualized them in their, um, in their times, nonetheless, they're thought to, as it were, slightly stand outside um, the great events of history and comment upon them from this kind of wonderfully wise um, vantage point. Whereas often when uh, women are writing, they're interpreted as writing within their lives. So um, there's a brilliant quote um, from Chris Krauss uh, in her fantastically entitled book, I Love Dick, um, which distinguishes between, um, as she says, poet men, presenters of ideas, and actress women, presenters of themselves. And I think you can see this if you think about, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft, a figure who I've thought about a lot. Um, you know, she was there in the French Revolution alongside Edmund Burke and Tom Paine writing vindications of the rights of men and of women. And um, all that people can do, all that people have done in retrospect, is talk about her love life. And, you know, her, her torrid relationships, her children out of wedlock, her suicide attempts. Um, the same, I think, also is often true of Virginia Woolf. Um, people are obsessed with who she slept with, um, as opposed to thinking about her as um, able to transcend um, her own self in terms of a writer. Um, of course, I think it's right that it, when we think about women, um, we do, and we, when we think about men as well, but we do think about the way in which um, the political or the external, as it were, inflects um, the, the writing. And of course, it was the kind of central tenet of feminism, of second wave feminism, that the personal is political. Mm. So, um, so even those things that appear to be domestic and private and personal are themselves the product of particular power relations. And there's, there's no space, there's no bedroom that isn't written over with power relations that are of interest to a political philosopher. Um, so I think that it's, it's good and it's proper for us to think about the relationship between the personal and the political, between the ideas and a life. But what I want to object to, what I want to push back against, is the double standard when it comes to thinking about male thinkers and thinking about female thinkers. And I think that this is brilliantly um, sort of encapsulated in recent uh, literature with two um, figures who it seemed to me wrote in some ways about the very same thing. On the one hand, you had Knausgaard writing um, you know, the story of, of, of parenthood. And then you had Rachel Cusk writing this extraordinary tri trilogy about, in, in part, about, about kind of motherhood. Um, and obviously she wrote um, explicitly autobiographical works before that. And Knausgaard is heralded as this sort of second Joyce, you know, writing, albeit, you know, he's writing about changing nappies, but he's thought of as writing the kind of universal truth. And whereas Cusk is often criticised for having sort of just written about her life. By the way, I think she's a much better writer than Knausgaard and writes much more universally than him. I'll <laughs> end on that note. <laughs> we'll take a poll afterwards yeah. uh, and decide. Thank you, Hannah, that was wonderful. I wonder, this is a tough question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm. I, wonder, I think I feel entirely persuaded by your sense of the disparity or what you call the double standard between the ideas in the ether oh. that are a lot, uh, is the lot of male philosophers or the, the kind of frozen in aspic con concepts and the life and the body very often from which women's philosophy and women's writing seems unable to be extricated. But I wonder if that's also our privilege for women. I mean, Audre Lorde, for instance, she mm. talks about self-care mm. and combing her mm. hair, and, mm. and she's talking about her cancer at that time. Mm. So of course, the, the personal is political. Mm. But what do we do? Do we then, to, to level that disparity, to, to set the balance, mm. do, we, do we proclaim our right to not have our life on the table and apparent, mm. like in Elena Ferrante, mm. for instance, mm. to insist not on mm. 
anonymity but pseudonymity mm. or do we embrace the body yeah. and the life and write like us yeah what do we do well it's up to us <laughs> i mean there's no i mean that's the point in a way there's not one answer i mean mm -hmm. in and ideally it should be for women for women authors to be the agents um of the sort of writing that they do um of and um I mean, I just was sort of talking about a kind of tendency and a prejudice for us to subsume women's writing into their self and for, their not, for them not to be kind of accorded the universalism that's often kind of automatically accorded to men. But I totally agree with you that it's also our kind of talent and our special, um, special privilege, I think, exactly, that we've, you know, that insofar as we've been brought up as sort of emotional embodied creatures, we can write very well about that. Yeah, yeah. And also, I wonder what I wonder if the challenge is to find a different mode of writing too mm. for women. I mean, the also I'm thinking about. I, I do want to ask you all about auto fiction, but it does seem to me that at the moment there are lots of women who are writing non-fiction. Mm. I'm thinking of Rachel Cusk, uh, Olivia Lang. Um, uh, you know, that there are lots of people. Marina Benjamin, who we had on the uh, on the stage a few weeks ago, um, uh, um, um, uh, Maggie Nelson. Yes. You know, these people who are these women who are writing in a philosophically inflected way, yeah. but whom it seems. I wonder if we're, we're also entering into a publishing market where a woman has to expose. Mm -hmm some flesh, in, to, to, to be metaphorical, that you have to give something of your life away in order to write that big non-fiction novel. I mean, Robert did it willingly, of course. Maybe Robert's the exception, and maybe you're, you're, you're striking for an equality there, but it seems you, there's a particular pressure on non-fiction yeah. women writers yeah. to, ex, for exposure. Yeah, well, uh, which is why I sort of go back to my point about agency and, and consent and, and um, women writers being able to set the terms of of their own writing. And so I think obviously the Elena Ferrante example is deeply pertinent here and yeah. poignant because as I'm sure you know, she wrote under this pseudonym. I mean, she is Elena Ferrante. That's all she ever wanted to be. And it was very clear that she wanted to preserve that on anonymity. And this extraordinary journalist, um, who I won't name, <laughs> went after um, her true identity and violated this very explicit, um, as it were, request that she had made. And I found that deeply disturbing um, and a kind of, a sort of literary rape, really. I mean, you know, that she'd made it very clear um, that she didn't want this. And her books had been about harassment in part. They'd been about the kind of violence, both psychologically and, and physically, that men put, do to women. Um, and then this man went after her and unmasked her. And that seemed to me to be a very sort of clear and appalling example of, um, well, of, of, of the predicament. Mm. And also, it seems to me her writing is, a, we shouldn't get into a Ferrante reading group, although I we think could. we should pitch that for an, another forum event, but it seemed to me a strategy on her part. Mm. And perhaps it's speaking yes. to some of the ideas that Robert's trying to get at in his work, that, that you could talk about experience from the inside and not give away something that would identify you and that would distract you from the almost universal particularity of that experience. That seems to be the experiment of those novels, to say something particular, mm. but not to distract you with the details of who that real person mm. was. And that seems to completely despoil mm. and ruin all of that experience. You've been nodding vigorously, Helen. Mm. I think you've got thoughts on Ferrante. Um, I love Ferrante, and I completely agree with your sense that it was an extraordinary violation to kind of out her in this way. But I was, I was nodding at everything you were saying because I was thinking how well you articulated that actually the real difficulty of that feminist tenet, that the personal is political. And that, that difficulty is something that Virginia Woolf has to work through mm. in her writing as well. Uh, she's somebody, as I said, who um, is fascinated by reading the lives of women. She avidly consumes memoirs of relatively obscure women from the past in an attempt to kind of construct a history of women's lives and she's one of the kind of great thinkers of, of women's history but at the same time in her own writing she's very very careful to 
disguise the personal and to uh, write, write towards something that she thinks of as a kind of impersonality yeah. or an anonym yeah. anonymity yeah. even. Not, not in the same way as Ferrante, mm. but uh, she's very wary of the literary critics who will come mm. along, and they, they do come along nonetheless, and try to kind of uh, psychoanalyze her writing, uh, or to yes. kind of make claims about things that happened in her life on the basis of the literary text, and turn the kind of process of, of reading into a kind of hunt for things that we cannot really know, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a political question for women uh, where the kind of the, the eye falls. Mm. Yeah. Wolf has this great uh, moment in, I think it's in A Room of One's Own, where she describes the process of reading one of her contemporary male writers. It's, it's a kind, it reads a bit like a pastiche of D.H. Lawrence. And she talks about the feeling that it's, it's kind of an interesting novel, it's all right, but after a while this shadow falls across the page mm. and it's the shadow of an eye the letter I, the, the, the male egotistical I, and he's always harping on about himself, and he's so in the foreground that you can't even see the female character behind him. There's this, a shadow that casts the female subject into shade. And so Wolf kind of reacts against this in her own writing. She doesn't want to be this hectoring, egotistical figure, so she's much more interested in a writing that is anonymous. That's when I cut to Robert, though. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But did you have some thoughts on, on, on Hannah's ideas? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, a couple of things. One about ideas and context and whether mm, they can yeah. be separated, and then on the, on the gender dynamic. And um, I was thinking as you were talking about the talk I went to a couple of years ago now by Tim Clark, TJ Clark, the art historian. Okay, yeah, yeah. He just published this book on Picasso and Truth, which I read and loved. Mm. But one of the points he made is like, for God's sake, why can't we get back to talking about Picasso's paintings rather than his <laughs> yeah, bloody love yeah, life? Yeah. I was like, it's always his bloody love life. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm sure there are far fewer counterexamples than there are the reverse. But it made me think of, well, who else is that? What other men figures is that the case for? Or their lives work subsumed by their, their life? Like, well, Hemingway, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Okay, which philosophers? Well, in a way, it's very Socrates, too. I mean, the death yeah. of, you know, uh, Nietzsche, arguably. You know, it's sort of... It's quite a trope, actually. I don't, I don't know. It'd be quite interesting to explore that from a gender dynamic, not for the purposes of tallying up, you know, who's, uh, who's more wrong done to. But anyway. Yeah. I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be an interesting uh, objective exercise. Um, but then on this idea of ideas in their context, you talked about Hobbes, and I was wondering, I know, I know you weren't saying that. I know you weren't saying because of what's mm. happening in England, Hobbes, who was in France at the time, wasn't mm, he? Yeah. Yeah, thought this. But the context was pretty important to his thoughts. But at the same time, you have other people writing, you know, Milton and others, mm. who don't have exactly Hobbesian thoughts at the same time. Mm. They arrive at very mm. different conclusions mm. about authority and mm. God and so on at the same time. Yeah. So context is determining, mm. but not ultimately, you know, finally 100%. So then mm. you're in an interesting debate, aren't you, mm. about where, you know, what's, what's above the line, what's below the line. Mm, yeah. um, and in a way, you know, what, you know, what are you into then? So, you know, 50% of Hobbes mm. is determined by <laughs> what's going on in the Civil War. What's the other 50%? Is mm. it, this, you know, this is learning, mm. it's psychology, mm. it's your proclivities, mm. um, something you happen to overhear in a bar in Paris one day. You, know, mm. you don't know, do you? Yeah. So mm. it's a much more kind of nuanced question, I think. Abusive father. Abusive father, really? Yeah. I didn't know that about him. Yeah. yeah. So there's a psychoanalytic reading there as well, isn't there? About yeah. you know the Leviathan, the sort of exactly. monster, the return of the repressed, yeah. um, and so on. So, mm. yeah. But I mean that sort of opens up to a very general philosophical question, isn't it, about yeah. agency and and, exactly. and determinism? And I mean it seems to me that we've already been kind of talking about agency mm. here, and that would even more so be the case thinking about ideas in context and Hobbes. I mean. Um, there's context and there's agency, yeah. and, um, and authors have choices. I mean, I think that's often, I was thinking about this with regard to the morality of, um, of when we look back at particular philosophers and if they've done terrible things, what we think of that, you know, how we think about that. Um, and often the um, answer comes, oh, well, it was a different time, you know, yeah. different norms applied. But the thing is that they had choices. I mean, you could be a slave owner, you could defend slavery, or you could be an abolitionist. You could beat your wife, or you could, you know, restrain from doing so. So I think that, I mean, 
I precisely agree with you that I, we, I want to assert the agency but what of are the, these authors. What are, mm. what are the, sorry to interrupt you, it's totally mm. fascinating, but what are the repercussions of that? So if, um, I mean, the example I was thinking of, of course, was Heidegger. Mm. Um, you could choose to be a Nazi or not, mm. but if you have chosen to be a Nazi, whatever the circumstances that might have compelled you, if you have chosen to be a Nazi, then does that mean we don't read the work or do we read the work with a different inflection? And especially in something like virtue ethics, for instance, you wouldn't take guitar lessons from somebody who couldn't play the guitar. Do you take virtue lessons from somebody who's had an unvirtuous life? What, I mean, what are the repercussions of that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a big debate in Heidegger studies and people who've gone on to study. I was thinking about Paul DeMann, you know, who mm -hmm. I studied in great depth when I was doing literary theory. You know, mm -hmm. should, we actually, should we stop reading... Paul demand just on principle. Because of his letters, the wartime, and the wartime, wartime journalism. Exactly. Do we read Mein Kampf? Yeah. You know, should we read that at all? You know, and then we're into a, a bigger discussion about, you know, freedom of speech and so on. Mm. I mean, I personally think we, we read everything that's available, and, yeah. and then we make our judgments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, it's possible for us to be complicated about this. I mean, it's possible for us not to brush things under the carpet, but also not to think that art and, light and writing might have a status independent from a life. I mean, that's in a way what I was talking about, the way in which um, ideas and writing do transcend lives. I mean, there was an interesting experiment exactly along this lines, although um, in the field of art, um, recently with Gill, with Eric Gill. Um, you know, what do you do about the fact that it turns out that he abused his daughter as well? What they did, very interestingly, was juxtapose um, accounts of what he had done with his work. So both were there. And, they, and it made for an incredibly unsettling but powerful and uh, important kind of viewing experience. And it turned out, I mean, obviously it depends on which, what kind of viewer you were, but I think that it turned out for many that um, there was a way in which both, you know, you came out with both. It wasn't like the one had to occlude the other. And I think that we are capable as human beings of holding multiple things in our minds at the same time. We've been talking about um, some very high status assets. Augustine, Rousseau, Plato, Socrates, Wollstonecraft. Um, can we talk about Katie Price and Alex <laughs> Ferguson and David Beckham? Because we've been talking about, this event is about biography and I'm alert to the fact that the Christmas season is upon us. Many of us have fathers, uncles, brothers, who are going, mothers who are going to receive. <laughs> the, but yeah, and, and so the great stockist of the biographies, biographies at the moment is Tesco's, it's Sainsbury's, right? And there's a, it's a popular market, the biography. I wonder what you think... What are the philosophical stakes in those kinds of biography? Why do people have an appetite for them? What, what, what is that? Well, I, you weren't expecting that question. I, I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> but I think it's hard to separate you know, the, the publishing of biography from the phenomenon of celebrity. Yeah. It? They're, 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 you know, they're mm. completely intermingled. So I'm not sure you know, buying a biography of Alex Ferguson is... Uh, massively different from you know, wanting to watch him you know, or as he would have been on, on TV or, or, or whatever. It's kind of on a continuum. So in that sense, it's just about celebrity consumption, isn't it? I mean, most interesting to me in that whole scenario is the phenomenon of the ghostwriter. Yeah. Because, of course, mm. most of these books aren't... The yeah. autobiographies obviously aren't written by a, a number of these people. So you know, to your point about agency and mm. you know, the, the description mm. of the... Of the life. I mean, mm. I've only ever met one ghostwriter once, and this is just a sort of anecdote, really. But she t told me, yeah, she, she basically writes the thing, and the person reading struggles to read it anyway, and goes, yeah, that looks fine. <laughs> you know. Did she float away afterwards? <laughs> she, I mean, she keeps herself pretty. pretty She's got to be a ghost. In the whole process, you know. So yeah. that's you know, they are very manufactured, yeah. and so the idea of you know a truth, a self truth being you know exposed. Is, is sort of pretty yeah. uh, tenuous at that point. Yeah. Hannah, I don't understand why people buy those straight Are you saying you're not susceptible to... No, I can't bear to, uh, them. Okay. No, I think they're so I boring. I mean, that's why, you that's, why, you know, that's why I want to transcend. I can't bear them. I'm, when I have to do, when I do sort of TV or whatever about these philosophers, you know, they, I want to talk about their ideas and they want to, they want to talk about what they had for breakfast. Yeah. 
Um, and, and that's why it's so exciting, this kind of current cracking open of the genre yeah. with Sheila um, Hetty and Cusk and Deborah Levy. Um, you know, the way in which they are taking the autobiographical, biographical form, where are they standing in relation to themselves? They're really, they're making it anew in the most brilliant way. Yeah. So much better than those old, you know, what the dads read, the dad lit. <laughs> yeah, we, we shouldn't. Uh, what do no. you think, H H Helen? I was thinking about a book by Josh Cohen, who's a literature professor at Goldsmiths and also a contemporary psychoanalyst. He wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Private Life. Yeah, it's a great he, book. Yeah, it's yeah. a really great book, and it, he thinks a lot about this kind of the phenomenon of contemporary sort of voyeurism, uh, our fascination with celebrity culture, with the intimate details of celebrity lives. Mm. And he, he cites at one point that phrase from, I can't remember the name of the journalist, one of those um, journalists who was bugging all the, the celebrities' yeah. phones and things. Um, and he, he, in his defense, claimed privacy is for pedos. You know, nobody has any right to privacy in, in our contemporary culture, according to this awful journalist. And, uh, but Josh Cohen offers a really interesting argument in that book that uh, our contemporary kind of popular understanding of privacy is rather a flawed and limited one and he, he makes the case from a psychoanalytic perspective that there is a kind of a form of private inner life that is not accessible by this kind mm. of genre of writing or of tv show and um, you know the kind of um, mm. celebrity re reality tv shows the idea mm. that what those are offering us is the private life is a, a flawed one for him there's a kind of He's, he's thinking in the tradition of British psychoanalysts like D.W. Winnicott, who theorise a kind of inner and almost inviolable private yeah. core that even the psychoanalyst cannot and should not enter Great. into. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's so fascinating. We have to open up our private conversation happily to the audience. Do we have questions? We do. Amazing. Let's take... Let's take two at a time. So the first one there, and is there, and the one over there, and then I'll come back. To you. Great. Uh, thank you for the conversation. I'm a student at LSE of political theory. Um, so philosophy has traditionally been concerned with how to lead a good and virtuous life. But even the examples that you mentioned, it's almost like you start reading about these philosophers, and their philosophy seems suddenly less attractive because you realize the kind of martial or the kind of flaws they've been through. So, uh, and in fact, it's intuitively, con it's something contrary you should expect, right? You read about these philosophers, if they have led a reflective life, then they should have led something that's better than an ordinary human's life. The only example that I probably can think of is Gandhi, who, when is you... Who? Gandhi. Gandhi. Right. So if you read Gandhi's autobiography, uh, although the human flaw flaws are exposed, in some sense the appreciation of his philosophy increases because he has led an exemplary life. So I was wondering if you have certain examples in mind where you read the life of a philosopher and you thought, okay, this is a life worth pursuing. Great, okay. Some people might contest whether Gandhi had an exemplary life, mm. but that's a good question. That's sort of a question about shouldn't they know better? It's a good question. But let's get the question over there. Thank you. I'd like to go back to a point that was made fairly early on, uh, which I think was that from a Freudian perspective, we all have these stories that we need to construct and also to recognize that they are stories. And I'm very interested as to how that sits alongside Jung's claim, I believe, which was that each individual has her or his own myth, which they very much need to live. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Great. Two great questions. Mm. Yeah. Any takers? And the, your question was also, which philosopher has lived an exemplary life? <laughs> Can I have a go? Yeah, have a go. I, I actually would like to push back on your question, because I would rather read uh, a philosopher who's sinned than one who hasn't. Because what's the learning in innocence? There's very little learning in innocence. You know, you begin to learn when you have things to confess like Augustine. We learn from Augustine because he's done things wrong. If he'd done everything right, there'd be nothing to read, and it would be very boring if there had been. So, you know, we need, in order to grow as people, we need to lose innocence. If we, if we have a myth that innocence is the thing to maintain, we'll never develop as human beings. So I would push back very strongly on that question. On the Freud-Jung uh, 
difference. I suppose for Freud, uh, stories do come out of uh, wishes that are repressed and then return in various forms, and that's how we construct ourselves. In uh, Jung, those myths that we live, we don't actually own. You know, they are available to all of us. They are part of a collective, what he calls the collective unconscious. And actually, for me, um, certainly the things I'm working on these days, I'm more interested now in the Jungian ideas because there's more and more research going on in biology and other fields about the way in which communication happens in non-conscious ways across fields, as it were. And Jung's is a very mythologized kind of version of that, but I think it's very interesting the ways in which we can actually pick up uh, information in non-cognitive forms, you know, through whatever medium it might be. And uh, myths is a kind of shorthand for what that, that might be, but the, the Freudian model of a kind of contained, you know, the, to use the Hamlet phrase, a, a mind contained within a nutshell. Yeah. For me, I think we're beginning to see the end of that notion, and that's, and that's a good thing. Um, I mean, I don't think Jung, uh, you know, in terms of his work on mythology, will, uh, because it's so arcane in so many ways, I don't think it's going to uh, attract kind of much connection, I think, from the scientific community on that. But I think the concept of stories coming to us from, from sources other than within ourselves is a very interesting one. I think I've just got a, f a footnote in a way to your answer, which is about Augustine, which maybe Augustine didn't do anything wrong. I mean, by the way, all Augustine did was have sexual desire. Stole some pears. <laughs> <laughs> Stole some pears. No, but I think, yes. But I also, of course, I mean, what is an exemplary life? Anyway, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I don't know if there is such a thing, and whether it's a kind of helpful category, um, precisely because... Um, as Robert sort of indicated, um, any life of necessity, and maybe even um, in a good way, is going to be dappled and er erroneous and you know, full of rupture and then repair. And that's, that's, that's what it means to live. I don't know what, what other route there is. What is the exemplary route? I don't know what the exemplary route <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, no, is. Um, on the difference between Jung and Freud, from my understanding of Jung, it is, it's about archetypes and uh, myths that are collective. And I, I have found that intriguing, but as you can probably tell, I'm much more of a Freudian. Um, what I find so fascinating about Freud's writing is um, precisely that there, are not, there is not a key to the unconscious. Each of us has our own kind of quite radically different relationships with with kind of collective symbols and myths but we have our own unique and precarious relationships to those myths whereas those i i, I find the um the jungian idea of, that we are kind of lived by these archetypes that i find uh, quite unsettling and anathema to, to, to my own way of thinking about the unconscious which uh, as i said i find that Freud's account, his kind of refusal that actually we could, the, the kind of the cliched version of Freud is that we can all, all look at a dream and say, well, that's a phallus, that's so and so and so. But actually, there's no universal key really for Freud, I don't think. It's about how you as an individual relate to the symbols that appear in your dreams or in your writing and so on. Great, thank you. There was another question. So there was this question here. Any others? Can I encourage some women to ask questions? We always have this issue at the forum. We love to encourage strong, brilliant women to speak up too. So there's a question here and one there as well. Thank you. Um, the panel has spoken um, about literature and perhaps science and then philosophy. Um, but it seems to me that narrowing it to literature um, is narrow. Um, there is a television um, uh, a, a film now in three parts called Churchill's Bodyguard, the Close Protection Officer, um, where um, the film uses the memoir and the literal words of the Australian who was Churchill's um, Close Protection Officer. And uh, this seemed to me a much more intimate portrait uh, showing 
Churchill's um, ideas of democracy and some of the large themes that the panel has also um, talked about. Do you, and uh, I, I thought the film in one sense was unique in that um, we do have uh, the biography uh, written by Churchill's daughter uh, to contrast with this of the personal protection officer. And it seemed to me this personal protection officer lived physically closer to Churchill, excepting for Churchill's non-political um, uh, need for um, a protection officer. And I'm wondering, um, is, is literature much too privileged as a way of showing um, important ideas um, through what was um, a personal protection officer who had the background of being a postie and who was <laughs> promoted up um, through, the, through the ranks. That's a, a great question. It sounds to me about biopics and so the film. So have the question yeah. So that, that is, I think that is the question, right? Should we get the, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Let's get the second question in as well. I think that's a really rich question that we haven't touched, that there, is, there are other mediums for biography too. So um, each man in his time plays many parts <laughs> on the stage of life. <laughs> um, so um, from what you were saying earlier on, yeah, you're trying to come to grips with the idea of who, what are we? <laughs> the essence of it is. So who's playing on the stage? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to. Who or what are we? <laughs> we'll do our best. That's one for Hannah. <laughs> you can have a go at the biopic question. It's a terrific question, mm -hmm. I think. I've seen some really wonderful lives of films recently. Um, can I have a go at the other one, actually? The who or what are we? I mean, I think, if, if anything, <laughs> big. The, uh, the, the, the point of biographies and autobiographies, or one of the things that comes out of them, is that they are narratives, they are stories. And yes, they're compromised in all sorts of ways precisely because of that. But what you tend to see in that, and I'm thinking about the, the Winnicott point here as well, is you see people develop over time. So I think it's much more important not to sort of surrender an idea of the kind of this essential who or what you are. Because we, we change. I mean, I thank God we change. And we change through making mistakes. We become a different who in our 50s. I'm in my 50s than I was in my 20s. And yeah, you know, my mum will still say, oh, you know, that's, that's Robert. But, you know, I'm not sure that's an essential me. And I think it's also quite constraining in some way to think about, you know, the who are you, the what are you, and so on. I think, uh, you know, if anything, that, I mean, there's a whole another evening, you know, yet another evening we could have about identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one of the many issues I have with identity politics at the moment is that it assumes there is an identity and this is it and we can, you know, um, and that that is a source of uh, something that defines us in some way. For me, identity is a very exterior thing. So I guess I'm just arguing for a kind of fluidity around that and that is actually a helpful thing for us to hang on to. I struggle with the notion of the essential in all of this because it suggests all sorts of things about what we are made up of which might not be true. I mean, I do a lot of work in a particular psychological technique. It's called uh, constellations, nothing to do with stars. And in that, actually, people manifest very differently according to where you put them in a system. You know, if you're a brother in a system, you know, you know then you're a boss at work, and, you know, the, the differences can be so marked that it's really hard to say, you know, this is the same person in these different contexts. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't have anything to say about the biopic question, I'm afraid. <laughs> but, uh, well, to continue from what you're saying, um, I mean, I think the answer is, and this does link to the biopic question in the sense that it kind of um, points to the plurality of viewpoints that one can have, for example, on Churchill, is that we all come from somewhere. I mean, we are situated beings. And um, I mean, obviously that's what 
I was talking about, I mean, I think about, if I think about the great Enlightenment thinkers, you know, the, the, the theorists such as um, Rousseau or Locke, you know, these figures who we look to now for, as it were, seeing the truth about human beings. They saw that human beings were free. They saw that human, human beings were equal. And yet, they failed to see, for example, that women or black people might be part of that category. So the kind of amazing way in which... Um, we, all the thoughts that we have and the lives that we lead, us, they, seem, they might seem sometimes to, as it were, see everything or be, reflect everything, but they're deeply partial and deeply situated, which is why biopics that kind of give a different viewpoint are so great. I was thinking about what you were saying, Robert, about um, the, your feeling that um, there is no essential category of, of, of being, no, no kind of unchanging identity over time. And yet, I was thinking also that it would be a profoundly disturbing experience to feel that there was no, no continuity. There's that by which we are, are identified. Mm, yeah. Kant talks about that, Ricoeur talks about that. <clears throat> we can be identified over time, mm. and we have an identity insofar as we can be identified. Mm. Whether that is the same as being, or essence. I mean, then yeah. we're into, you know, ontology and the rest of it, aren't we? Mm. Um, I don't think being an identity can be conflated, that's for sure. No. Mm. Do we have other questions? There is one here. Oh, that's got oh one. and is there one? Oh, wonderful. Well, let's take that question and then we'll get over here as well. It seems to me that you could have a biography, perhaps um, a celebrity biography, of who I met. So this is a series of external interactions. But really what you're always talking about today is the unsettling internal debate. And that can be stimulated by external events, but also, mm. and I think very frequently, you refer to situations approaching unsettling mental ill health. Mm. And it seems to me, and I have a little experience of this myself, that um, the experience not of, of different persons across your mm. ages, as you mentioned, but having living four different personalities simultaneously mm. who do not agree with one another, mm. have different values, um, have different ways of thinking, um, mm. and almost can be seen as puppets outside you, mm. which are, are um, interacting and quarreling, and, and then you get better, and you come back to almost a unitary self, mm. but you've experienced this very odd thing. There's a bit of you can bubble out and, and become its new self, and you don't forget that. And I'm wondering how many people that you prefer to meet, uh, Rousseau probably, I think. Did, did Hobbes have a mental health problem? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Orlando, and, uh, mm. Orlando is somebody who's mm. different, spread out over time. Mm. But you, you could also think of that as, as reflecting one personality you know, all together. There's, a, there's an opera by Janacek, uh, The Macropolis Affair, where a person has a elixir of eternal youth and she goes through to like mm. seven lives and eventually decides, no, I'm not going to take the elixir this time. She dies at the end of the opera. Mm. And all the different people she interact with. It seems to me this, 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 this multiplicity of who you are as an individual is actually what makes a biography interesting. And mm. maybe most of those biographies are never written. Mm -hmm. That's such a beautiful question. Let's That's tackle good. it. Let's try. Thank you. Mm. Um, so in um, part of what I do is uh, I um, do some work with organizations, helping them in different ways, and I have uh, some mental health organizations as clients, and I work with their, their boards on different, on different uh, subjects. And one of the subjects, obviously, that comes up is psychosis and schizophrenia and you know, all of those things, and multiple personality disorder. And uh, it is interesting that actually the path to mental health, to use that old-fashioned term, uh, is often seen to lie in restoring to people, assuming they once had it, <clears throat> a coherent single sense of self. Mm. Because then you, know, you are located in a certain experience and can respond you know, therefrom. So just in terms of, kind of rehabilitation, clearly, for people who are in that kind of distress, you know, the, the coherent narrative is important. But we then kind of move along a bit of a spectrum because there have been, you know, I can't, there must be thousands of work talking about the connection between mental health and the 
and creativity. It goes back, and Plato talks about it, and it goes back you know, a very long time. Freud talks about it in the Creative Writers and Daydreaming essay. He actually says at one point, uh, the words to the effect of no happy person would ever write literature. Mm -hmm. Because all of liter all creativity for Freud comes out of some kind of repression, as it does for Melanie Klein uh, as well. So those are people who, to use the uh, kind of buzzword, I suppose, those are people who, are there, who have sublimated what might other be a mental, serious mental health issue into creative works. And so the creative works are, ascent, you know, are therapeutic for them in some sense because they, they provide an outlet mm. for it. Then we have a kind of, uh, and, you know, moving mm. further along the spectrum, I guess, you have actors who act different personalities. They know who they are, but then they can adopt you know, different per personalities and so on. Further along the spectrum still, you have psychic mediums who will channel spirits and so on. Yeah, I guess it depends sort of where you are on that spectrum. Um, but it is interesting that certainly in mental health practice, you know, the, the, there is a lot of um, value placed on creative uh, therapies in order to, uh, order kind of, in order to commute what could be a destructive manifestation of personalities into something which is more socially acceptable, i.e., art. So um, I guess that's one way of one way of thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's another big subject. Isn't it? That's such a good question, um, and sort of just as a kind of footnote in a way to what um, Robert has said. I mean, obviously. There is a way in which the writing is the therapy, and also um, that the experience of the self-fragmenting is often a, a route to greater understanding. I mean, and it sort of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning with um, regard to kind of instability and. Um, the confessional narrative. I mean, if you think about Augustine's confessions, you know, it's all about this sort of cracking open of himself um, and, and what it might feel like to, to, to lose, lose the ground on which we stand. But I don't think it's to say that, you know, madness is a necessary condition for great writing, but there's no doubt that um, it can both help and it can both heal. The madness. There's a, I'm reading Lisa Abagnese's um, Everyday Madness mm -hmm. at the moment, which is a brilliant um, kind of um, just description of the everyday madness of grief and what that does to her personality. Helen? Yeah, I think that's really important what you're saying now, kind of about not, not that there's a risk that isn't there that we romanticize mental ill health. Mm. Um, it's not always a state in which one can produce great works mm. of, of literature or art. Uh, but I'm also really interested in a, a, a tradition of British psychoanalytic writers and thinkers. Uh, we've already mentioned D.W. Winnicott, but I'm also thinking of a, a writer and psychoanalyst called Marion Milner, who wrote a book in 1950 called On Not Being Able to Paint. Mm. And it's a, a, a kind of, it, it's what it sounds like, it's a book about a kind of artistic block uh, and it's a full of drawings and doodles and diary entries and she'd written a number of books well she'd written two books before this in the 1930s one was called uh, a life of one's own and the other was called an experiment in leisure and both of them set out a kind of method of using diary entries doodles drawings just little drawings that one does for oneself not to put it on display in an art gallery and she she develops this argument about creativity not just as a kind of self-healing or a kind of therapy or even a way of getting to know oneself. Uh, these are autobiographical texts, but they don't really tell us any details about the writer's life. They're really about creativity as a method of, uh, that she's offering up to her reader as a method of self-understanding, of understanding one's own wants and desires in an era of rising fascism, an era of mass culture, an era where everyone's telling you what you want and you don't really know how to kind of extricate yourself from all the desires and wants that are imposed upon you. So creativity there, in that psychoanalytic tradition, becomes also a kind of a method of living, not just uh, a kind of form of therapy mm. or um, a way of kind of writing one's own life, thinking that anyone else would be interested in it. Mm. Yeah, but I, I'm really interested in it now. Um, 
It does, does strike me that, although we did try to, to get to film, it does strike me that we are all in different ways writers. And in fact, I was thinking about the waves, Virginia Woolf's waves, in response to your question, that there is maybe a way in writing sometimes to get at that very fractured experience of our vulnerable, precarious mental health. There was one last question over here. Can we take it and then we'll, we'll close? Um, my question was just to come back to the discussion of innocence, which we touched on quite briefly earlier. Um, it struck me, just as you were saying that, that, you know, sort of what we might consider several of our foundational texts or myths, Oedipus the King comes to mind straight away, are actually about innocence, about the tragedy of what one cannot know because of the constraints of the self. Um, and, you know, it strikes me that perhaps that relates to, Hannah, what you were saying about the, um, the, the constraints of these great male philosophers. Um, I'm wondering in, in what, whether there's a sense in which um, all of these projects, biographical or philosophical, however you label them, are, are grappling with this question of innocence and, and how the, the circumstances of the self impose limitations on what we can know. What, what, and what we can have insight into. Mm. No, go on. <laughs> well, um, I mean, innocence is a, is a big topic. Um, there's a theological, you know, heritage behind it, that the loss of innocence, the fall, and the kind of myth, myths that structure that, which then seem to feed in in multiple and probably over-determined ways into then legal concepts of innocence, which have a sort of theological residue to them. You know. um, so there's a kind of overlap between the two of them there. I was also, I'm very interested by a philosopher, psychologist called Bert Hellinger, who talks about innocence in a, from a different point of view. He says, innocence is, uh, is not a moral uh, phenomenon or theological phenomenon at all. It's simply the feeling of belonging. We feel innocent when we belong and we feel guilty when we don't. So uh, when we do something wrong and we are excluded from a group, that's the feeling of guilt. So guilt is its not moral, it's not legal, it's not theological. It's that which accompanies a moment of exclusion. And that's actually what lay behind my answer to your question earlier, because actually being excluded is also what happens when we develop and grow. So for example, if we leave a job or a relationship, we often feel guilty when we do so because we are leaving a belonging group mm. in which we have felt innocent. Mm. But the process of leaving, which is a guilt feeling essentially, is for Hellinger, the feeling that accompanies action. So guilt and action go together. And since we're on the subject, <laughs> it's, well, it's his account of how of Nazism, to come back to the subject, how is it possible for perfectly ordinary German men, in most cases, to do, do what they did? You know, were they intrinsically evil? His answer, no, probably not. How many people are intrinsically, you know, would thousands and thousands of people be intrinsically evil? Were they manipulated by the state? The other answer, yeah, probably. But what allowed them to perpetuate such atrocities was essentially they, they were securing their belonging to the Nazi movement by doing what they did and therefore they killed in all innocence, according to Hellinger. Morally, utterly guilty, legally, utterly guilty, but from this point of view, utterly innocent. And you can apply it to kind of gangs, gang members, you know, they get sent to prison, what have you, they're excluded from society, but actually they feel all the more innocent insofar as they're taken further into the belonging group of the gang or whatever it might be. So innocence, you know, has that other, you know, yes, there's a theological origin to it. Yes, that leads into uh, judicial, legal definitions of innocence and guilt. But I think this other way of looking at it is, is fascinating and worth, certainly worth thinking about. But maybe we shouldn't call it innocence, then. Maybe we should just call it belonging. I mean, innocence, I mean, it seems to have completely slipped its semantic moorings in your analysis. But, but, no, but, I, but also, I was very interested in um, your answer and, and the way it connects back to your question in the sense that, that maybe with, with regard to this notion of kind of fragmented or constrained self and that it struck me that, that another way of kind of interpreting the meaning of the word innocence is to think of it as an integrated self um, and that sin or the loss of innocence 
is to think of a divided or fractured self, which is exactly kind of Augustine's thought yeah. in the Confessions. And I do think that the question of innocence, I mean, in a way, you know, it goes to the heart of the history of Western philosophy. I mean, it, you know, it, Western philosophy begins, as it were, with the ancients. And um, they were innocents, that's to say, they were optimists about human nature, and their question was, how can you be happy? How can you lead a good life? And then you have Augustine, who says that we are fallen, sinful creatures, um, and, and philosophy takes this kind of other route. And I think that to think about it in those kind of bifurcated terms is really helpful um, as the term. Yeah. that makes all the difference, yeah. Which exactly then feeds back into how one thinks about oneself as a self. It's interesting, it's not in St Paul. I mean, it kind of, there's another route it could have gone. You know, it went into Augustine, but if we'd stuck with St Paul a little longer, we'd be in a very different place. <laughs> yeah. I'm so grateful, though, to Augustine for telling it how it was. Yes. Or how it is. That's to say that, you know, life's hard. Mm. I don't want to end on that note. No, no. <laughs> I wonder if you can bring it back. Well, maybe you can close for us. Oh, um, that's quite a responsibility. <laughs> I, I teach a, an undergraduate module on, called Modernism and Childhood. It's about modernist literature and representations of childhood, children's literature, and uh, largely also about psychoanalysis as a kind of modern discourse of childhood. And we've done three weeks so far this term, labelled Innocence 1, Innocence 2, Innocence 3. <laughs> so I should really have a great answer. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's such a complex idea. It's so difficult mm -hmm. to step outside the actual idea and the language of innocence. Part of this module is uh, about trying to encourage my students to think about the ways that um, the idea of the innocent child is a kind of fantasy that we project onto childhood as a means of disavowing all of our own anxieties about ourselves as adults. But it's astonishing how difficult it is to step outside the association of childhood and innocence. It, it, it's so kind of hardwired for us. Yeah. Presumably innocence three is less innocent than innocence one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, we it are. is. We are, we're guilty of keeping people from their supper. So uh, what an excellent segue from me. Um, can I encourage you to join me in thanking our really fascinating guests, Hannah Dawson, Robert Roland Smith, and Helen Tyson.